Hello, welcome to another episode of I Was There Too. My name is Matt Gorley. This is the show where I talk to people who may have had small but significant roles in films and are willing to tell you all about it. Today, Jamie Donnelly is back from Greece. It's Greece Part 2, not the film. It's a sequel to the podcast we did about the first Greece film. If you're a regular listener, you might remember a month or two ago... Jamie Donnelly, who played Jan the Pink Lady, and Barry Pearl, who played Duty the T-Bird, were on the show. We talked so much about the origins of the movie, specifically its Broadway run, that we didn't even get that much into the film. So Jamie's back to fill us in. Unfortunately, Barry couldn't make it. As you'll hear, he's out on the road. But it was wonderful to sit down and really get into the film with Jamie. You'll hear stories about stagnant L.A. river water, sea breeze chamois, and Johnny Depp finger kisses. There's nothing else to say. Let's get into this. The film. Greece. The year. 1978. The role. Brusha Brusha Jan the Pink Lady. The actor. Jamie Donnelly. Well, it's time for Greece Revisited. I've got Jamie Donnelly back here. We're missing Barry Pearl, unfortunately, but he's out of town for a good reason. He's working with Joey Travolta at his film camp for the developmentally disabled. But I am so happy to have Jamie back. Last time, we barely scratched the surface of the film, Greece. We talked a lot about the stage production. So uh, I think we'll start with a question that deals with both, just to segue into the film. And then we'll have this a casual conversation because the sky's the limit now. We can talk about anything. Yay! Hey, good morning, Matt. I'm back. How are you? I am so happy to be here. I'm so happy to have you. Yeah, I feel like I'm now a recurring character. You are. You clearly. On your you're one show, of. Matt. Yeah, one of. You, I think three people that have been on this show twice. Well, the- it is a joy. It is really fun. And last time Barry was here, but Barry is away. But. It's fun for me to get some time alone. I know. It's you. nice for us, yeah, to have some time together. Yes. Barry will get his time in the sun. Yeah. It's about you and me now. Yeah. <laughs> when he comes back, it'll be an- another story. But <laughs> now it's our time. So let's talk about Jan. Jan. Yeah. Jan, from stage to screen, did you feel that there are any differences between your stage presentation of Jan and the film presentation of Jan? For instance, was she a, a snacker on stage as she much as she is in oh, film? She, snacking is the thing you can be sure is the main constant, and that would never change with Jan. <laughs> but I think I made it even clearer uh, in the movie, because in the movie, I never didn't have something that I was eating. Uh-huh. There was not a scene I was in, and as you know, I was in an awful lot of scenes. That's right. And there was never a scene that I did not have at least one snack or something in my mouth. And I had to keep it in my mouth all the time because <laughs> you never know when they're going to cut to you or what part of it is going to be. Yeah, how sick of that food did you get? Was it well, disgusting after a while? I got sicker of the food doing the Broadway show. Because imagine this, Matt. Imagine that you're at the theater, you're showing up, you're going to do a couple for the day. It's a Wednesday matinee. And you see a huge box. I don't know. How big is that? Like, oh, five, five, five by six feet? Some big, big cart. <laughs> and it says Twinkies on it. And you look at that carton and you know the only person who is going to eat <laughs> oh, all those oh Twinkies my God, when you look at it that is way. you. Yeah. You know, you see huge cartons of Reese's peanut butter cups coming in. And you realize, I am the only person who's going to eat everything in that enormous box. What was the Twinkie budget on that show? <laughs> oh, my was, God. And sometimes it was like, oh, these Twinkies are getting old because they would all be like crumbled oh. crumbs inside of oh, the yeah. plastic there. Dried out. And so then, you know, you have to kind of tilt your head back and <laughs> and swallow them down, you know. And that's uh, that was when the Twinkies would get a little stale. But nothing got, had the chance to get too stale for the movie. Uh-huh. But it was all day long. Like um, 
but I, I had some tricks. Like I knew that I could make it look like I was, and uh, certainly on the stage, it, I, it was rice pudding, which you can get rid of quickly oh. out of your mouth to sing. <laughs> what was rice pudding? Rice pudding the... was what was on, on the lunch, on the lunch uh, cafeteria trip. Oh, gotcha. Okay. Coming in in the morning. Oh, right. I mean, at, at the, for the first lunch of the year at Rydell. Uh huh. And rice pudding was easy to get rid of quickly. But in the movie, I really wanted to use the uh, spaghetti. Uh huh. You know, so oh, I used the spaghetti, it, yeah. yeah, twirling it, and then, you know, using the silly thing of doing it with Patty Singh's <laughs> ponytail. That was so good. <laughs> but I did, I did, I did like to use food that you could really see uh-huh. in the in the movie more. But yeah, she definitely eating was her thing. But I'll tell you, um, on the changeover, I had thought when they called and said that they were interested in me coming in for this part again. It was seven years since I had done the show. And when I did the show, I felt like I was really old for that part. <laughs> so I couldn't believe that I was actually coming in to play a young teenager again. Uh -huh. But, uh, you know, I was, I, I was happy to come in and do it. But I thought, you know, what could we do? What could we do with this character um, to make it maybe a little more dimensional? And so I went in, and when they offered me the part, I went in and talked about what I would like to do with the new Jan in the movie. And the difference between what I'm going to tell you and what you actually saw is a pretty big difference. But I said, I think it would be cool if being empowered by her group, you know, the gang, the Pink Ladies, the Pink ladies yeah. and then getting a boyfriend during this year, she, you know, winds up with Putsy, who is actually called um, Roger or Rump in the stage version. Rump. Rump. That huh. was his nickname. And, and I think it was Alan Carr's idea to change him into Putsy. But yeah, he was called Rump. Rump, Rump, Rump. But when it was like, you're going to have a boyfriend in this. And Rump, Rump was different than Putsy. Uh-huh. Um, and, and they said, as you're making, and I thought, but as she gets this boyfriend and it is her senior year, how would it be if at the beginning she's eating like crazy and she's, you know, plump. And then as the year goes on, she begins to grow uh -huh. and she loses the weight. She feels more secure because of the gang, because of the boyfriend. It is a happy time. Senior year, she's got a good boyfriend. Yay. And she starts taking the pounds off. And there are references to her losing the weight. And now I'm going to do this thing. And everybody loved that idea. <laughs> <laughs> and there were references. For example, you remember in the Frosty Palace scene, I come in with Putsy, yeah. and we're both looking kind of happy and young, love lovish. This is, you know, we're always looking something, whether you're looking at uh, us no, or I've not. No, I noticed this when I watched it. This is the first time I went, oh, there, and I am. Look at that. Yeah, Jan right. And Putsy. We're looking at each other, and, and, um, and I'm looking at all that food on the table that is everything that I would have taken one off of everybody's plate not long ago. And I go to look, go for it, and I think, mm, I don't think. I don't think I'm going to do this. Yeah. I'm not going to do this. And then, uh, th then I, I say, uh, my mom's apple pie is better than this. <laughs> Why don't we go back to my house? And that was that. So that little scene played out as part of this idea. And you'll also notice in the last scene, I'm wearing a green dress, mm -hmm. um, and that dress is well fitted. And you can see that I actually was not. That plump one. Well, not at all. The role. Yeah, it's it's funny that they even categorize you as plump in this film because <laughs> it's not, it's a non-issue unless it somehow is mentioned by the other characters. Well, it's 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 kind of funny because, but I, you know, I I do think that image and it, you know, people did not have the consciousness that they do right. now about women and what you're, you know, what you're supposed to look like. It, it was just a different consciousness back then yeah in 78 much less the 50s when this takes place too yeah yeah, yeah. so it was it's i really think a lot of it i thought of it as being kind of image and like a, 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 a the an idea of being like what we used to call baby fat 
you know, that yeah. she was always, and that she was good natured and that she was easygoing and that she had all of those characteristics of a sweeter person who's trying to act like she's as tough as everybody else, yeah. but just so thrilled to be included all the time. <laughs> but so, so that in that green dress, you can see, and I actually think I kind of show off a little bit there, you know, once we're doing, um, you're the one that I want. I think it's merited. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. But in the beginning, I'm wearing very loose and baggy stuff. <clears throat> but that's how you would know if you watch the movie that what I'm telling you is true, that there was this transition made. But any lines or anything like that that ever were in there would have been, you know, not so used. Is this an I Was There Too exclusive where you can now watch this film? Has yeah. this, have you talked have, about this haven't anywhere? I have talked oh, about this. This is exciting. Okay, you can watch this film and watch the secret trajectory of Jan <laughs> yeah. throughout the film. Yes, her, the empowerment of Jan. Well, let's extrapolate that on because I was actually going to ask you a question about what the future of Jan and the other characters would be. Even though they mention in the end they liken you to, uh, I think, an Eleanor, Eleanor Roosevelt, Roosevelt because they clearly show you that when the principal is talking about yeah. that. So if this movie. It's 2016 now. This movie was made in 78, but it took place in the 50s. Yes. So it was basically 30, made 30 years ahead of its time. So this would, if this movie was made in 2016 now, where we get to see the current day Grease characters, it would be in the mid 80s. Does that make sense? Set wow. in the mid 80s. <laughs> it would be set in the mid 80s. What do you think Jan would be up to now? Well, you know, I really have to say that it isn't really like Jan is a million miles from what I'm really like as a person myself. Uh -huh. <laughs> Honestly, sometimes people think they know me because they know me as Jan. Mm -hmm. And I say, you know, kind of, I am a lot like this. That's it's nice. not that, I'm not that big a difference. But I think that Jan would be a family person. I think she would be absolutely like still friends with her old friends. I think she'd be married to Putsy. I really think that they are a couple that is <laughs> abs you know, you know Kelly, uh, who played Putsy, is married to the woman that was his girlfriend when we were doing oh, wow. the movie. And they were high school sweethearts and they are still together. And they've been in love all this time. We still have fun together. Oh, that's nice. So he's like that. I've been, um, I've been uh, with my husband for 38 years. Wow. <laughs> so I think we really played, <clears throat> of the relationships between boys and girls, we had the healthy one in that movie, I think. Yeah, it seems like it. You know, because you think of the way that Rizzo and anyone – you know, Rizzo had her self-esteem issues. Or, yeah. You know, Marty and not Marty and Vince Fontaine, you, you couldn't call that. You know, it was really, we were the kind of like ones that could last, I think. So, I think so too, yeah. Yeah, so I think we would still be together. And I think we would, you know, be the ones who throw the reunions back at Rydell. Yeah. <laughs> I could even see my kids at Rydell. And, and I, I mean, I really thought she could be working at Rydell. Even when I said she, they say Eleanor Roosevelt, and I look like maybe I could be Eleanor Roosevelt. I was thinking maybe I could work in the office or you principal. <clears throat> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. You you guys do strike me as the safe bet for the steady couple because Sandy uh, and Danny they were passionate. They were all passion right. that could burn out. Right. Kanicki and Rizzo, who knows what's going on there? Yeah. Yeah, I think you guys are the safe bet for the long We're haul. We're the safe bet for the long haul. And, you know, they we were kind of a safe bet in a lot of ways. Um, he was a fantastic dancer. Kelly was a guy who could do any move that Gene Kelly did. Uh -huh. He had perfected those moves. <laughs> he had been dancing his whole life. He was, I think if I've got the story right, he was out of USC, as was Randall, the director, and... They were drawing from USC students as they were getting started on the movie. Because he wasn't not in the stage production. Am I correct no. about that? Because he was very young, right? Yes. He was 10 years younger than I was. Yeah. Oh, nice going. Yeah. And <laughs> Jan the Cougar. <laughs> no, <laughs> not really. I think that we were, you know, I was pretty immature. Let's uh, let's put it that way. 
<laughs> but um, he was he was younger, but he was a fantastic dancer, and they I believe he was helping Pat teach the dance steps oh. to people coming into audition, and they just kept looking at Kelly, thinking. I want to keep looking at this guy. He's adorable. This guy is great. And so he was he really came in from a different direction than any of us. It was fun for me because he was so open and he he was ready to to do whatever I told him. To do. <laughs> well, you had 10 years on him. You got some authority. And I had done the show. <laughs> That's right. And he also Kelly had come to see a show that I had been you know, I did a number of Broadway musicals, uh, which was really my my great thrill was to do musicals, and still I still feel that way. But uh, I had done a show called Rogers and Hart. Richard Rogers yeah. actually sat at a piano and taught me how to sing "Falling in Love with Love" as "Falling for Make Believe." Wow. Imagine that. But anyway, that was Rogers and Hart, and it was a wonderful choreographer named Donald Sadler, who was a ballet choreographer as well and did fantastic dance numbers. And I had told them when I went into Rogers and Hart, because I'm a little Chan-like, I said, <laughs> the way you have a t choice, either give me harder dancing than it looks like I can do because I will push, push myself to the limit, but it's going to take me, a, don't go by what it looks like the first time I try it, I have to really work hard and then I'll make it look really fun. But you've got to put, give me hard dancing, or you've got to get more material for my costumes. <laughs> because I, this is my workout. My show is my workout, and I need, to, and I need to, to do that. So I had big dance numbers in this show. And Kelly had seen the show when he was a little kid. It was his first Broadway musical I think he'd ever seen. And he loved me in that show. So this is somebody he had seen, you know, as a kid. And I was thrilled because I had the best dancing partner you could possibly have, the sweetheart of a guy. He was just a dream. And so we, we, we had a wonderful time. The fact that he was so committed to his girlfriend was perfect because then we didn't have to, you know, wonder, uh, yeah. should we be flirting right. for real? No, <laughs> no, the answer was clear. He was with the right person. And but so we could just absolutely be, you know, Jan and Putsy. And Pat Birch, I had worked with Pat. Now, if this is of interest, she was, uh, she was a dancer and performer. And she had been in, um, you know, like Jerome Robbins. She, she like West Side Story, wow. those kind of things. Um, and she, there was a show that came out called You're a Good Man, Charlie Brown. Uh -huh. Original company, off-Broadway. Pat was the choreographer and the standby for Lucy and Patty, the two girls. Mm. So the, I actually have a funny little history back to Pat from that direction. But I'd known Pat for a long time before we ever did Greece, And I knew her steps. I, I mean, I knew the steps that we did in Greece. I knew the freedom she gave to people to character dance, basically, to take who you are, who the character is, and then fill it with Pat's you know, energy, and uh, she she let us do a lot with what she, she gave us very basic stuff and then let us play on top of That's that. That's apparent when you're dancing because you seem very technically proficient, but you're filling it with character, which is the thing That's that it. I think is vital to watch something like that. I, I love the craft of dancing, but if there isn't a person behind those eyes yeah. doing that, That's it's not, what, yeah. That's what makes it more fun, and that's what makes it, Grease like. Yeah. But she said to Kelly and me, she said, <clears throat> You two, like at the dance, she said, I'm going to be counting on you. So always be on your toes, basically. Always Even be doing something. Even if it's a something. wide shot yeah. and that kind of thing. Yeah. She said, Because I want to be able to cut to you anytime yeah. and know that we're going to get something cool. Um, for your relationship with Putsy in the film, was that something that was intended from the beginning or in the script, or did you just develop that on set and say, let's carry this through line through? Um, I think that it, it came in with the uh, screenplay draft, that, that this new character was going to be something more than that for Jan. Mm. Um, but, but, you know, Rump was a great character, too. I mean, and it was sort of the same, but Rump was, Rump was, um, he was really funny. He was like 
he was heavy. Uh-huh. He was heavy. He was the butt of many jokes. Rump as in rump roast then? Is yeah. That why, yeah. Yeah. Okay. And, and so he was, so he was, he was uh, more of a comedy character, I would say, less yeah. of a, less romantic. Um, but yeah, so I think it came in with the screenplay with Bronte Woodard hmm. that they gave me a little more romance. But you know, it was like it was Rump was the one who called me Bucky Beaver. Uh huh. Called Jan Bucky Beaver in the stage play, and then I think we talked about that on the last yeah. on the last the last time I was here. It was in trying to remember what were funny things that we did. It was like, ah, oh, Bucky Beaver. Can pull that out? But that was Rump's line. He calls her Bucky Beaver. <laughs> He's very disrespectful. Yeah, really. <laughs> take some issues with Rump. Yeah. Good riddance. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to take a small break and we'll be right back. Okay. Hi, listener. Does my sleepy voice sound relaxed and just a little bit at ease? Well, maybe because it's 7.30 in the morning and I'm recording this behind closed doors so as not to wake up the rest of the house. But I also sound relaxed because I just woke up from a long night's sleep on a Casper mattress. What? You didn't expect a commercial, did you? Don't laugh, it's too early. You see, Casper is a sleep brand that created one perfect mattress sold directly to consumers, eliminated commission-driven, inflated prices, no more crazy mattress guys with swirling text on TV telling you what to do. Casper's award-winning sleep surface was developed in-house, not your house, though it will develop in your house if you buy one. It has a sleek design and is delivered in a small, how-did-they-do-that sized box. In addition to the mattress, Casper also offers an adaptive pillow and soft, breathable sheets. The mattress has springy latex and supportive memory foam for a sleep surface that's got just the right sink and just the right bounce. Not only supportive physically for your body, but are you going through something emotionally? They'll tell you what you want to hear about yourself. This mattress will whisper things to you that you want to hear about yourself. You look great in those gauchos, Matt. You are the man that the world needs today. Plus, its breathable design sleeps cool to help you regulate your temperature through the night. Casper mattresses only cost $500 for a twin size mattress, $600 for a twin XL, $750 for a full, $850 for a queen, and $950 for a king. Now that's a price tag fit for a king, a California king like me. I was born and raised in California, and I am a king of the world. Buying a Casper mattress is completely risk free. Casper offers free delivery and free returns with a 100 night home trial. That's one less than an Arabian Nights. Maybe that was a thousand and one. The point is it's 730. If you don't love it, they'll pick it up and refund you everything. Casper understands the importance of truly sleeping on a mattress before you commit, especially considering you're going to spend a third of your life on it. God, I always forget this part. It creeps up on me, and it makes me remember the futility of life. I guess buy a mattress. You might as well sleep well if you're going to die soon. Oh... Anyway, get $50 towards any mattress purchase by visiting www.casper.com slash IWTT. Use offer code IWTT. Terms and conditions apply. Casper, we're sleeping our lives away. Hi, everybody. It's still 7.30 in the morning. Well, it's 7.35 or so now. Wouldn't it be something if I not only slept on the mattress of the previous advertiser, but just ate the meal of my next advertiser last night? I had a Blue Apron pork sizzle. I don't remember what it was called, but I do remember the taste impression it left on my tongue buds. And what is Blue Apron really, other than a tongue buddy? (laughs) Blue Apron. I love these meals. The night before, we had a cod patty. And right before that, we had a beef guy. For less than $10 a meal, Blue Apron delivers seasonal recipes along with pre-portioned ingredients to make delicious home-cooked meals. Here are just some of the meals available in July. Spinach and basil testo. What? Spinach and basil pesto gnocchi with summer squash, green beans, and fresh mozzarella. Spiced pork tacos with avocado, pickled onions, and elote-style corn. Summer vegetable pizza with garland lemon broccolini. Who wants a winter pizza? The Starks. But they'd all most, well, it, 
spoiler, but it, a lot of them don't anyway. Check out this week's menu and get your first three meals free with free shipping by going to blueapron.com slash I was there too. Blue Apron. Tongue buddy. Oh, let's talk about the uh, the end of Greece where Sandy quote unquote changes for Danny and goes against her nature as a good girl. <laughs> But now I've read that the playwright, Jim Jacobs, said that that was a poke at films where the bad guy always becomes good at the end. And it was a bit of a reversal, though. Some people see it as a controversial sort of things that it's sexist in its way that the girl has to change for the guy. Was this ever an issue on set? Do you have any thoughts on it now? Well, I, I, those things you just told me, the first one I never heard. I never heard. Jim Jacobs say that. I, I sometimes wonder if that was an after-the-fact justification or if that's truly his intention. I don't know. Yeah, well, I would believe anything that Jim says because he really, I mean, this guy really does know what it was for real. These guys, uh, like, the characters like Danny Zuko, the name was the name of a real guy. Oh, really? You know, these were real people in Chicago, <laughs> friends of Jim's. And Warren's, and so he, you know, I think he knew what, I think he did know what he was, what he was talking about. But um, I mean, I thought at the time when, when, when I first did the show, I thought it was a joke on what women had to do, kind of to, you know, how they had to put pull themselves together, and that it made it look kind of silly uh -huh. in a way. I mean, I guess this is because I grew up in a time where feminism became. A huge consciousness for a lot of us. It was just kind of funny that this that this this is what she had to do and this is what everybody did. And Punching made, up the absurdity yeah, of it. Make, yeah, made okay. it, making it kind of a joke because to me, the reason that Greece is especially successful is that it is funny and mm -hmm. that that it's it's the it's the social commentary uh, is is pretty ridiculous, you know. And, I mean, it's always true what a guy will do to get a girl, what a girl will do to get a guy, <clears throat> who they think they have to be. These are all very universal. But S Sandy's look, that manner, that way of having to uh, parade around, <laughs> basically, <laughs> which is fun, I think is, uh, I only thought of it that way. I just thought, take it over the top. In that kind of way, you yeah. know, okay, now be the sex pot, you know, <laughs> really. It was no more nice girl. It was very bold strokes. Yeah. You know? Is there, correct me if I'm wrong, but there's a difference in the ending with the film and the stage version in that, do I have this right? In the film, Danny Zuko is going to be a good guy, but in the stage production, he stays... A bad guy, is that oh, right? That might be true. I may, um, I, I may have to check into that. Yeah, I mean, I don't know how you would know from either version that he was good or bad in the end. Other, yeah, other than the broad strokes of a Letterman jacket versus a leather oh, greaser yeah. jacket, you know. Yeah, does he put the greaser jacket back on? Now I'm trying to remember. <laughs> I don't know, and I don't know if he does in the show. Well, the whole thing becomes such a wonderful absurdity in the first place because regardless of the transition that they make, they both end up somehow ascending to heaven in a classic car. <laughs> anyway, where are they going in, in the end there? <laughs> Off into the heavens and they leave you all behind. Yeah. Well, yeah, that is a little strange, but I think that's like a dream. Yeah, yeah. I think <laughs> even for them, you know, even for them, there because there are such things throughout, which really actually plays well in the yeah. movie version. Yeah, beauty school dropout. Yeah, that you get an angel to drop from the sky and give you advice, and 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 all your girlfriends are in the he heavenly choir too. Yeah. You know, so I think that that taking off is really just we're so high we could fly. You yeah. know that kind of. We're so happy. We're so in love. We're over the moon. I yeah. think it's kind of like that. Huh. The thing that was is amazing to me when I look at myself in that scene, since we're talking about me, oh, whoa, uh, <laughs> since one? I'm the one that you've got whoa, here, Jamie. But it was. I thought a third person entered this room. Oh, right I now. do a lot of different voices. Oh my god, I like to that do. was incredible. <laughs> well, thank you. I think I looked over my shoulder. <laughs> anyway, I, I, I see that when the when the um, when the car goes up in the air, and you know, I. 
guess this wouldn't be an exclusive, but there really wasn't a car going up in the air when they were shooting. Our <laughs> there you spot. have it, another Iowa State two exclusive. Maybe I shouldn't be telling tales out of school, but no, we're, we're really we're not looking at a real car taking off and going up into the sky at the time. <laughs> but we had to act like wow, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we, you had to act like it was a big deal, and I jump up onto Putsy's shoulder. Uh -huh. I literally do like a little plie. That's a little preparation. I look at it, and it's like a little preparation, a jump, and I'm up on his shoulder. And I think to myself, I can barely get up from the floor to standing, you know, <laughs> <laughs> these days. That's not really true. That's not really true, but I could never do this today. This move, it just looks like, oh, just jump up on his shoulder. It's like... Yeah. <laughs> wow. And that's, again, testament to Kelly, because I'm sure a lot of it was him getting me up there and keeping me up there while How I was How many times around. would you do a take like that? That we probably did a number of times. I don't think that was a quick thing because they wanted the – you know, every time you have to get that many faces in the same shot while they're moving yeah. at the same time and people – are sometimes not doing exactly the same thing, and all of a sudden you've covered Rizzo or you know whatever it is. So uh, quite a few times of doing that little hop up onto his shoulder and wave on up to the sky. <laughs> you know, it was just wow. I'm glad I was so strong then. <laughs> I read that most of the carnival stuff was shot pretty quickly, is where the gym stuff took a long, long time with the yeah. heat and all. We talked about it a bit last time. Yeah, but. the heat was so bad on. Uh, I, I, I remember it being worse outside, maybe because of the brightness, but oh, there were, yeah. I, and people really were dropping like flies out there and, and being given salt pills all the time. But yeah, I mean, imagine if you were somebody who had to do one of those rides all oh. day long. Oh. The, uh, I couldn't do the spinning ones, even once. No, yeah. no, you couldn't. And it was like people, I could see some people would arrive in the morning and go, oh, great, I'll be on the ha-ha. You know, it was like, don't, that's not us. Putsy, you and I are going to be on something that stays very level, goes back and forth. We were on a thing that moves in and out, back and forth. It's like, okay, that's good. We don't have to turn upside down or anything. Because I love amusement parks, but yeah. So it was, that was a strenuous thing to be shooting that many people doing that much partying out there yeah and, it's such a high energy level for every take oh yeah and wide shots and that sort of thing yeah and they would have to spray down the brown grass with green so that because it didn't look green at all a anymore. paint or a dye or I, I don't know you know they come around with like a huh. i don't know would something. that get on you no oh. i didn't get that on me mm. The thing you didn't want to get on you in Greece was the water from the L.A. River. <laughs> I heard, yeah. It was pretty stagnant and made some people sick. Is that right? R Randall Kleiser, the director, got a big uh, – got, got a high temperature from being in it. Oh. You know, with us, they <laughs> put uh, – you know, what, what was, they used to put sea breeze up our legs, right, to keep us cool. Do you know what sea breeze no, is? No, I know what sea breeze is. <laughs> Not, it's not the breeze. No, Sea Breeze is a product that used to be sort of an astringent. It's a, it's blue comes in a bottle. Yeah, I remember the bottle, but I think of it as like aftershave. But yeah, it, yeah, it's like an aftershave okay. type thing, but it's sort of menthol. Okay, yeah. So they would have it's just like buckets. coating your legs with a Vicks, but <laughs> <laughs> kind of. They would, but they would have buckets, big buckets, and in the buckets was, were ice. Ice water, and in the ice water was the sea breeze, and then they had chamois cloths, like what you would, you know, put a, clean your car with in the old yeah. fifty days. Yeah. I was even around in those days. Uh. They and that, so they would they would bring out these buckets, and they, you know, they would wring out the the chamois with a sea, frozen sea breeze on it, and then they'd just run it up your legs. Wait, you so know? there was someone on set, maybe even more than one person responsible, <laughs> for shammying you with ice-cold sea breeze? Yeah, that was happening. That was happening. to keep. Not everybody got this How treatment. do I get that job? <laughs> <Jeez>. <laughs> but they, And then when we were going into the L.A. River, they actually, over the sea breeze, they put 
I think like plast saran wrap or something around on your legs, so that knowing that we might be affected by this creepy water oh. at the time. But Randall was, you know, a guy and the director and tromping right on through <laughs> until the next day when he, you know. <laughs> had the 103 fever or whatever it was. <laughs> well, I'm sorry to say I don't think the L.A. River has improved any, although I think it's about to. They're about to undergo a huge yeah. parks and recreation change with yeah, it, I think. I think everything is better. Yeah. Uh, isn't everything really a little better and cleaner? And I hope so. I hope there's, I mean, if not, it's very sad because yeah. the consciousness has been there to do that yeah. now for a while. Yeah. Yeah, I think they're going to do wonderful things with that river <laughs> one day. <laughs> All right, Jamie, I want you to clear up a little gossip for me. Uh oh. Okay. It's, it's long been rumored that Stockard Channing's hickeys in the film were real and given to her by Jeff Conaway. Do you know if that's true or not? I can't say for sure, but what I can tell you is that for sure Jeffrey would have <laughs> wanted to do this. <laughs> that's <And> enough. <laughs> the the that, question is would Stockard Channing let that, him? Exactly. <laughs> That would be my question. Would she go along with this? But she was really trying, you know, she was getting down a lot in that character in, in a way. To the um, point of like method acting or? Well, I actually, I don't know. I don't know her process as well. And even, but and I, and I have tremendous respect for her. I think that she's great. But um, yeah, I think she, you know, she comes from uh a very highbrow place. Yeah, I was going to ask. Yeah, so she had to kind of drop down uh, social, <laughs> socially drop down a few levels to, you know. <laughs> to, to stoop to the to levels roll of the with <laughs> the 50s homies down. Yeah, who, who were the more serious cast members and who were the more, uh, I don't know. I, well, I don't think any of us could afford to be too serious because that the energy of the piece is so high and and happy. I mean, yeah. Aside from very, there are very few people who have you, that you see go down at all. But so so it was, and we kept that level up. It really was. It suits it. It makes sense. Yeah, and we would. You, I mean, you've had Barry in here, and you've had me in here, <laughs> and we're both pretty high energy. But when you put these people together, it really starts bouncing all over the place. And and they did not contain us, because a lot of the good stuff would come out when people would be acting out yeah. or crazy or something. Yeah. But I would say that there's a pretty good likelihood because Jeff was out there giving hickeys about his <laughs> – I mean I think – He just had a hickey booth? I, I, well, I think even, you know, I, I wouldn't be surprised with Jeffrey after the movie was over. Uh, I think Jeff saw himself as, uh, you know, the, the hickey – the Hickey King. The Hickey King of Hickeys. Yeah. yeah. After that. After Were there that any other romances on set? Um, I you know I don't, I you know I don't know I don't know about anything that was not clandestine. Fair enough. <laughs> You have every right. So that doesn't seem fifth. like it's re – I have to plead the fifth on that's fair. That that's a, a fair answer. Okay, good. So this ended up being the biggest film of 1978. Did you get to go to the premiere? What were your thoughts like afterward? Did your life feel like it had gone through quite a change? And mm, it, it really did not feel like it went through quite a very big change. Um, the premieres were great, you know. I. I the funny thing is, I, I of course, I did not know then that that would be the the, the highlight of my career in terms of the public uh, perception uh -huh. of my career. And I shouldn't say that too soon because no, who I knows think, uh, what yeah, lies ahead. <laughs> but fair to say that. but I did not. I didn't see it that way. And you know the the ways that my life, uh, my the I uh, some of the things that everybody really wants to get out of a big success were not that important to me in in real life. Mm -hmm. I mean. For example, a television series. <laughs> I, I didn't really want to be on a television series very much. I I like to have long rehearsal periods and really know what I'm doing and know that the jokes I'm doing are, are – I've learned how to make those – get those laughs in a play. And I, I was really more of a theater person yeah. anyway. Um, but I think, I think if anything, it made me feel a little bit off the hook in terms of doing something that's out there. What a know? nice way to look at that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, less as a stepping stone and more as 
something that I could appreciate. And now let's do yeah. something yeah. else. Because then I did. You know, I did. My life changed a lot. Well, let's talk that. about some of these things you've been doing. Yeah. You were recently in the Johnny Depp film Black Mass. <gasps> that was so much fun. Man. Yeah. Oh, I'm just now coming back out as, and it really is. It's like I'm coming out as a performer again. You know, I've been in the closet for a long time. Well, you were out for a long time and then you went back in. I went out, I went back in, now I'm out again. But while I was in, I was always involved because for like the last 20 years or so, I've been an acting coach and I've worked with really, really great people. I'm kind of a secret weapon and worked for the studios and worked for the networks and I've worked for a lot of production companies and actors and directors in and, and, and improving performance and supporting actors and, and that's been a joy and I did a lot of that during the time that I was uh, a mom too uh-huh. because I became very other directed at that point. Um, my wonderful husband and I adopted two children from Medellin, Colombia oh. in 1987 and 1989 and that was when I became more other directed than ever before yeah. uh, as a mother. And so it was It was not too long after that that I became a coach and worked in, in the early days, particularly with young people, uh, kids on set. And really a lot of it is you know, being, uh, being believing eyes that see pe- the best of people and able to um, sometimes see their performance before they've got it so that I can help them get there a little more. But it de- everybody needed something different. It's easy for me to see how that would be the case because you're such a warm person. And in my experience with directors, I find it so difficult when they come at you from a, a sense of pressure and mm-hmm. immediacy and I need this and I need it from you now. And someone that's there to support and kind of understand exactly what they need to get from the person. But in a positive way. I I don't see how actors can thrive in any other way. I don't see how some actors thrive under the threat of fear. I really don't. Thank you. I don't either. If somebody's like, show me. Yeah. I'm like, prove it. "Um, Maybe I could come back. Uh, (laughs) I don't want to show you right now. You know, but if somebody says, you can do this, I go, okay, let's do it. You know, but I know not everybody's like that, but I've had, I had a wonderful time being support for people and, and I still do that with uh, with people that I really love to work with and who call on me when they when they want me. But anyway, that, I did that for a lot of years, and it's only recently that I decided it's time for me to come back out. That's right. You now you've been in Veep, Black yeah, Mass, as yeah. we mentioned. Black Mass was a thrill because it first of all it was Johnny Depp. And um, my scene was with him, and it was only one day. But it was, I mean, this, is, this, is, this guy is so generous, such a fine actor and such a great support to a person who just came on set to do one scene with him that day. And uh, the scene changed completely from what it was. The director... Um, really handed this script over to the actors and people improvised and played with it. And um, I didn't know that when I came that, that day. I was watching out of the the, uh, the house that was supposed to be Mrs. Cody, my character's house. I was all dressed in clothes that looked like my grandmother's from 1974 because I am Irish-American. Uh. My four family names are Donnelly, Madden, McFadden, and Flaherty. Oh, Lord. And we're from the Northeast. So I, when I went in, uh, to to wardrobe to play Mrs. Cody in Black Mass, the room was filled with my grandmother's clothes from 1974. They had a full wardrobe for me as though I was in every scene in the movie. They were just going to cho- choose something for the one scene. But I looked and it was like I saw the shoes on the floor and the name inside Cobbies. It was like, I haven't seen that shoe since my grandmother's closet in the 1970s. And all of a sudden... And the costume designer said, well, it was the, the director wants uh, you to represent the Irish-American people who were doing well. And so we're therefore happy that Whitey Bulger and his brother were in charge. It was like uh, the, just come through the Kennedy days. It was like great to be an Irish-American in Boston at that time. And I said, well, then if that's who I am, 
these are my clothes. And I took my grandmother's clothes. You chose the specific garments? Yes. I was, and, and she said, and they all wore um, those um, scarves over their heads. And I said, well, not always. That was, we had them in our pockets for church because you were always going in and out of church. So like you, a babushka kind yeah, of thing? Yeah, that kind yeah. of thing. Because <laughs> we would put those on. You, you had to put them on when you went into church and came out. So that that's why that's on my head in the thing. But I, I knew who who this character was, and I got to be my, act like my grandmother. And but he, when they when he came in and met me, and we just spoke as Mrs. Cody and Whitey when I first met Johnny on set, and they walked back out and they changed the scene. You the, mean that you you spoke in character to each other yeah. off? Yeah. Not shooting. Yeah, I said oh. he said Mrs. Cody. Oh. I said, Jimmy, it's good to see you, you know. And and so I looked out the window of my little house, and I had watched the way that it was set up to play. There were children in the scene that Whitey was going to give my groceries to the kids to take in. After we met, they went outside. They sent the kids home. I felt sorry for the kids because they had really been looking forward to being in a scene with Johnny Depp. Uh-huh. But they completely changed the scene, and they brought in the older gangsters to do to play the scene too and johnny turned it into this thing i mean I, the, the, i'll tell you if this doesn't sound like heaven you don't see this in the movie because it's cut way down but um he's i had my last line was aren't you an angel jimmy and my dad is jimmy by the way and he's an angel so that was an easy line <sighs> for me yeah. Aren't you an angel? Jimmy? That's my dad's name, too. Your dad, yeah. too. Wow. <laughs> my, and my grandpa and great grandpa. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, <laughs> Jamie. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, but that's another story. But um, so when I, I said, You're an angel, he takes me in his arms, Johnny Depp, holds me close, and whispers in my ear, You are the angel. He says, You are my angel. You've always been my angel. And you always will be my angel. And I said, oh, Jimmy. (laughs) (laughs) And I kind of like pulled back and look up at him. And he took every one of my fingers and kissed my fingertips and said, you are a blessing. You're a blessing to me and you're a blessing to all of us. I mean, these lines weren't in the script. One hand or all ten fingers? All my fingers. In both hands. How long did that take? (laughs) We were there all day, <laughs> and, I, and, and, I, and it seemed like it was too short. Well, Jamie, I'm so glad to have you back Thank for a second you. round. Who knows? Maybe we'll go for a third time. September. I would love a third date. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jamie. Okay. Thank you once again, Jamie. What a peach. What a wonderful guest. And how about Johnny Depp kissing all ten of her fingers? Did you know in the movie Casino Royale... When Vesper goes through that trauma of the fight they have in the stairwell and Bond enters the shower where she's weeping, they're both fully clothed, but he starts sort of kissing her fingers to symbolically clean the blood off of it. He originally kissed every finger as well, but they found it to be so off-putting that they used CG to move from the beginning to the end, skipping out the middle fingers. If you look really closely, you can see it kind of dissolve. Anyway, a lesson to all you men out there. Don't kiss all the fingers. If you have a guest for me for I Was There Too, please email me at IWasThereToPod at gmail.com. You can find me on Twitter, Instagram, and Letterboxd at Matt Gorley. And check out NowHearThisFest.com because I Was There Too will be live at the podcast festival this October. And I'm working on a very special guest. Have a wonderful fortnight, tongue buddies. I hope you didn't fast forward through the ad because then that would make no sense. But I stand by it. Hey, podcast listener, why not go to a podcast festival like the one that's about to rock your podcast world? It's called Now Hear This, and it's coming up October 28th in Anaheim, California. It's like Comic-Con for podcasts. Three days full of podcast events from your favorite shows and hosts like Comedy Bang Bang, How Did This Get Made, Mark Marin, The Brilliant Idiots, Super Ego, maybe even I was there too, and many, many more. Tickets go on sale the morning of July 11th, and they will go fast. Go to nowhearthisfest.com for more info. Earwolf. 
This has been an Earwolf production. Executive produced by Scott Ackerman, Adam Sachs, and Chris Bannon. For more information and content, visit Earwolf.com. Earwolf.com.